Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, and mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. us as we are, makes us new, so take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, I give my life to follow everything I believe in. the grave, that you are the hope of the nations, Lord, to all who would call upon your name. Lord, you are reaching out your hand to us all this morning. I pray that we engage with you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just, I didn't have my mic on on purpose. I just wanted to mess with those guys back there. Just like, so you know, make a little panic set in back there. So, uh, hey, if you got your bulletin, please open up to the ministry reminders here. I've uh, got several things happening uh, today, this week. Uh, first of all, uh, we have been renovating our office space across the street, as many of you know, and we have gotten a, a great deal done on that. We're going to work the next few days to try and get uh, all that we're hoping to get done. We're going to have to hire some things out after, but uh, trying to get everything that we can do done this week. So if any of you are able to help, we would certainly love to have some help. We've got some friends here from... Uh, where I grew up, my, my father-in-law and some others who are helping, and they've been a tremendous help with that. Uh, but love to have, have anyone this week who can help Monday through Wednesday. That would be great. 
2021 mission trips. If you are interested in going on a mission trip in 2021, or if you would just like more information about that, we're going to have a meeting immediately after this service. To It'll be a very brief meeting, just kind of going over uh, what we're going to be doing, where we're going to go, dates, and all those type things. Uh, we're also going to live stream that, so anyone watching, we are going to live stream that meeting. I know there's a lot out this morning because of weather and illness and various things, so we will live stream that mission, uh, mission trip meeting. Uh, Operation Christmas Child is coming up. Uh, there are shoe boxes out here in the hallway you can grab. Our church goal is 200 boxes, so uh, grab some of those and uh, help us pack those up and, and send those out. Uh, I, for those of you who may not be aware, Samaritan's Purse, which is uh, uh, Billy Graham, his son Franklin, uh, is the, the, he's the leader of that organization. And uh, basically what Operation Christmas Child is, is we put various things for kids in those boxes and uh, there's uh, some tracks that go in there I think there might be a bible that the organization puts in there but there's uh, basic human needs things as well that go in there and those boxes are shipped around the world to children in impoverished areas so if you're able to and and feel called to help with that there's some boxes out there you can grab finally uh, we're going to have our missions offering this is something our church always gets excited about and always really steps up for but on Sunday December 13th we're going to have our Christmas missions offering and uh that offering, uh, 100% of what comes in undesignated, we give away to the International Mission Board to help send and support missionaries around the world. Our church goal is $22,000, which seems like a, a really big goal, and it is a big goal, but we believe that we are going to not only meet that, but exceed that. So just wanted to, uh, to mention those to you. I also want to read you a couple of verses this morning. This is from the book of Lamentations. Now, you might think Lamentations is a book of lamenting. Why would we read that? We need something uplifting, especially on a snow day like this. But uh, Lamentations was written by Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And Lamentations is a lament over the fall of Jerusalem that he saw happen in 586 B.C. He is weeping over that. Um, and in the first few chapters, he writes about the affliction of Israel and the difficulties, the captivity and all of that. But then in Lamentations 3, we see this. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. And then he says this, this I recall to mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. Let's pray. Father, right now, we thank you for this text that we just read. Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. God, even the, the change in season that we are experiencing, God, that is a picture of your sustaining hand. It's a picture of your faithfulness. Year after year, the seasons change because of your sustaining hand. Thank you for your faithfulness. M new every day are your mercies. Lord, if we were to count the blessings in our lives as the old hymn says lord we would be here a very long time for you have blessed us abundantly so many different ways so lord this morning as we come into this room as we are many watching online right now lord i just pray that our hearts would be lifted up to you that we would be mindful of your grace in our lives be mindful of your mercy lord as we open up your word today as we continue our study of the old testament book of micah as we come to chapter 3, another heavy chapter. God, I pray that we would heed the warnings we find there, that we would love you first and foremost in our lives. God, as we sing these songs, as we fellowship together, Lord, everything we do, may it be for your name, for your honor. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's stand together and let's Shout out this anthem together that he is our great rescuer, that we are free from sin because of the cross. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound! Oh, how about we will praise the Lord our rescuer let's sing that again he's our rescuer he's our rescuer we are free from sin forevermore and 
for the hearts of your people, Lord, as you call out to all, Lord, to put their faith in you, put their trust in you, as you fight our battles, Lord, as you go before us leading the way that is narrow. God, you are victorious in all that you do, and we praise you for that, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Micah chapter 3, Micah chapter 3, as we continue our study of this Old Testament prophet. Micah chapter 3. Leadership is so important. There have been some wonderful, God-fearing leaders throughout history who have led their people to great places. Think of biblical literature. I think of people such as Moses and David and Nehemiah, Paul, Peter, John, and so many others who are great leaders. There have been a lot of evil leaders throughout history who have led their people to dark places of pain and regret and shame. Leadership matters. Unfortunately, as what we're going to look at today, the leadership in Israel and in Judah in Micah's time, both civil and religious, were corrupt, utterly corrupt, utterly evil. They were self-serving. They were self-absorbed. They were money-hungry. They were full of pride and covetousness. They were indifferent toward the needs of those around them. They were looking out for their own interests to the exclusion of those that they had been commissioned to serve. The way the world normally views leadership is very, very different than how the Bible reveals it. The, the world sees leadership as being aggressive, being loud, being effective at all costs. The world thinks that leaders should be the most gifted, the most successful, the best looking, the most together, the most known people, those that do whatever is necessary to push their agenda forward. Yet, we who know Christ, we who know the Scriptures, 
have a vastly view on leadership than the world. If you've been following along with us the last few weeks in our study of the book of Micah, you know that God was going to allow the northern kingdom of Israel to fall at the hands of the Assyrians in the year 722 B.C., and he was going to allow the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, to go into captivity at the hands of the Babylonians in the year 586 B.C., And he was going to allow this because of his people's continued sin and idolatry. He had given them opportunity after opportunity to repent, warning after warning. He had sent multiple prophets during this time preaching a message of repentance, men like Micah and Hosea and Amos and Isaiah. Yet the people of Israel and the people of Judah did not listen. They unfortunately listened to the false prophets who shared a message of peace, a message of prosperity, but not to the true prophets who warned of discipline unless they repented. Last week in chapter 2, God, through Micah, addressed the people of Israel and Judah and briefly the false prophets. Today, as we come to chapter 3 in our study, the, the, the leaders in Israel are addressed, both the civil leaders and the religious leaders, the heads of Israel and the religious leaders. You will note as we study chapter 3 that it is very similar in content to that of chapter 2. There were just so many problems in Israel and Judah at this time. From the top down, so much dysfunction, so much injustice, there was blatant idolatry, and where we find idolatry, we always find injustice at the societal level. What or who we worship determines how we treat our fellow man. The the problem with Israel and Judah at this time was that Yahweh was not her God. They had gods, but not the true God. And as a result of that, their focus was off. Their minds were mixed up. Their lifestyles were askew. And today we will see charges that God brought against the civil and religious leaders in Judah. In this chapter, just like in chapter 2, we see the tragic results of when a society attempts to push God out. Now, God is omnipresent. God is all places present at all times with his whole being. God is omnipotent. He has all power and cannot be pushed around by man. But every person, every one of us in this room, every society will look at God and we will either say, not my will, but your will be done, or in arrogance, we will look at God and say, not your will, but my will be done. And there comes a point when a person or a society continues to choose their own way over God's way, where God will eventually say, fine, have it your way. Have it your way. In fact, I think that hell is the ultimate expression of this, the ultimate and final expression of this. Think about hell for a minute. Hell is simply God giving man what they've asked for all along, and that is a life completely independent of him. When a person or a society embraces the mindset of not your will, but my will be done, God will allow the consequences of that person or that society's choice. This was the case of Israel and Judah in these days. God was largely absent from society. Again, God's always there. God's omnipresent. But God was largely absent from society due to Judah and Israel's choice to reject him. And when God pulls his hand off of a society and gives them over to their evil choices, confusion and brokenness follows every time, period. In this chapter, we will see how corrupt and how messed up and how desperate a society becomes, the brokenness that reigns in a society that woefully rejects God. Look at Micah chapter 3, verse 1. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob, and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? So he starts out here with, Hear now. Here now, the, as I said a couple of weeks ago, the three major oracles or prophecies in this book start out with the word here. Chapter 1, hear, O peoples, all of you. Chapter 3, hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Later in chapter 6, hear now what the Lord is saying. And what is happening in each of these three major oracles is God is calling, calling a court to order, so to speak. And he addresses here in chapter 3, first of all, the evil and the corrupt civil leaders, the governmental leaders in Judah. He says, here now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. And the first question he asks them is this, is it not for you to know justice? 
The point is this, God is saying, you leaders in Israel, you leaders in Judah, you are the ones who are commissioned and ordained to uphold and ensure that, society, that, that justice is being fairly administered throughout society, yet, I believe verse 2 gives us a very telling phrase as to why they were being derelict in their duties. Look at verse 2. It starts out this way, you who hate good and love evil. Now that, that clearly tells us why the leaders in Israel and Judah were doing such a bad job and why they were not concerned with justice. It's because they hated good and they, it's because they, they, they hated what was good and they loved what was evil. If you want to follow along in your bulletin, there are five principles we find in this text. Principle number one is this, where God is absent. Absent due to rejection. Where God is absent, confusion becomes the norm. Confusion becomes the norm. Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet said it this way in Isaiah 5.20. He said, woe to those. Again, remember, from a prophetic standpoint, when a prophet pronounced woe, that was a pronouncement of judgment. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what was happening in Israel and Judah and the divided kingdom at this time. The leaders were corrupt. What was good, they called evil. What was evil, they called good. And so God asked the question here in Micah, is it not for you to know justice? You see, a person can't judge righteously. They can't administer justice when their morals are utterly bankrupt. They can't judge righteously when their moral compass is broken. And these were those who ruled over and who made judgments between people throughout all levels of society. So from the top, you had evil people leading the nation. You see, the problem with the leaders in Israel and Judah at this time is ultimately they had reprobate minds. And this was, this was well known. This was not, what Micah is addressing here, this was not an isolated case of a few corrupt politicians, which we know politicians would never be corrupt, right? I mean, we know that. This, that's not the case here. This was widespread. This was, to use a term that we are overly familiar with in the year 2020, this was a pandemic of moral decay among the political ranks in Israel and Judah at this time. It was widespread. Remember I said before that the contemporary prophets of Micah were Amos and Isaiah and Hosea. Amos and Isaiah used the exact same language in their prophecies when addressing the leaders. Listen to this. Amos 5, 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Isaiah says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. So we see a theme throughout this era of history in Israel and Judah. Their conduct, the leaders, their, their conduct, their inequitable judgments against others were driven by their worldview. A worldview that said evil is good and good is evil. It was ultimately a worldview that was void of God. For all practical purposes, the leaders in Israel and Judah in this day were living their lives like they were atheists. As if God were not even there as if God were not watching, as if God were, uh, were, were, were not even a reality. God didn't factor into the equation of their lives, and yet they are leading others. Now, from a biblical vantage point, we know that everybody worships something. Everyone worships something. Even, even the most staunch atheists today who claim that they worship nothing worship something. We all do. We have been created by God as people of worship. Our hearts are drawn to worship something. That desire to worship is placed in us by God. It is innately within us to worship something. And in the case of the civil leaders in Micah's day, they didn't worship God, they simply worshiped self. They were idolatrous. And their idolatry led to their mistreatment of others. And here's how we know. Look at verses 2 and 3. You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them, and their flesh from their bones. Who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones, chop them up as for, as for the pot and as meat in the kettle. 
Principle number two we find in these verses is this. Where God is absent, and this is, boy, this is so relatable today to where we live. Where God is absent, people become expendable. Where God is absent, people become expendable. The leaders in this day, their degenerate, idolatrous minds led them to destroy and consume their own people. People that they had been commissioned and entrusted to serve and protect. The leaders in Judah at this time, they were to be civil shepherds of the people, and instead they had become butchers. And we all know the difference between a shepherd and a butcher. That is the exact picture, the imagery that is being used here. In fact, notice how graphic verses 2 and 3 are. These verses are not about a wild animal instinctively killing its prey. They're not even about a person killing an animal in order to eat. This is about people who were figuratively consuming each other. And Micah goes on and on in great graphic detail here about this. In fact, read these verses again. Look at verse 2. You who hate good and love evil. What is the result of hating what is good and loving what is evil? You tear off skin from them and flesh from their bones Eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them, break their bones, chop them up as in meat for a kettle. That is graphic, very, very plain language. It shows how the leaders in this day saw their people as being a means to an end and nothing more. A way to satisfy their own voracious, greedy appetites. Like a hungry animal eats its prey alive, so did the governmental leaders of Judah eat God's people alive. Whatever is unjust is fueled by idolatry. Whatever it is that is unjust in our world, if you trace it back to its root, it always goes back to idolatry. And where God is absent, life becomes expendable. We see that in our nation today. Life just does not mean that much to many, unfortunately, in our day. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy that is driven by a worldview that ultimately says man is supreme and God is to be pushed out. So here is God's response. Look at verse 4. Then they will cry out to the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the divine name of God in the original language. They will cry out to Yahweh, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hold his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. The picture here, like verses 2 and 3, is also a very, very vivid picture. These leaders who were tasked with keeping watch over the people These leaders who were supposed to judge fairly, they had failed. As people came, the the idea is this, as people came before them and they cried out to them for justice, as they were before the leaders, the judges in Israel and Judah, as as the poor who had been oppressed and deprived and had their land stolen, as they cried out to these judges for help, they turned their eyes away. They turned a blind eye. They accepted bribes. In fact, verse 11 tells us that. They accepted bribes for a good judgment. Highest bidder got the good judgment. They were easily paid off. Justice did not matter to them. So the imagery that God is using here is this. He's talking to those judges. He's talking to the leaders. And he's saying, just like the poor cried out to you for mercy and you looked away, so you will cry out to me for mercy in the day of judgment and I will turn aside from you. I will be silent. I will not answer. I will hide my face from you. Why? Why would God do this? Well, it tells us in this verse, at the end of verse 4, it says, because you practiced evil deeds. You practiced these. There's one thing, you know, we, 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 all, we all mess up at times. We all sin, but there's a difference between messing up, sinning, and then being convicted of that, repenting of that, and saying, God, help me. God, have mercy on me, and then just living in it. Habitually living in it. There's a big difference, and that's where the leaders were. They, were, they didn't seek God, they sought self. The the pattern of their life was not seeking God. It was seeking what satisfied themselves. Now look at verse 5. And verse 5, by the way, marks another shift here. God begins to once again address the false prophets. Look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. When they have something to bite with their teeth, when they have something to eat, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. Principle number three here is this, where God is absent, greed flourishes. Where God is absent, greed flourishes. We know from the New Testament that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. The love of money has been the source of countless wars throughout human history, violent bloodshed because of money. The love of money has been the source of enslavement for many peoples. The love of money has been the source of 
many people being prostituted. It's been the source of human trafficking, the source of broken relationships, and many, many other sad and tragic things. In the same way, the greed of the false prophets here was evident. So in verse 5, God indicts, he says, the prophets who lead my people astray. Now from that designation, we know that he's not, God's not addressing Micah. He's not addressing Isaiah or Hosea or Amos or any of the other good prophets in this day. He is obviously calling out the false prophets here. A true prophet doesn't lead people, a, a true prophet leads people to God, not away from God like these false prophets were doing. And here's, here's what they were doing. As long as they were cared for, these false prophets, as long as they were paid, as long as, he says here, they have food in their mouth, they cry peace. In other words, you, you take care of me and I'll give you a message you want to hear. I don't care if it's true or not, but you feed me, you take care of me, and I'll give you whatever message you want to hear. But if they were not paid, then it says they preached a message of judgment. They declared holy war. Then, after paid, they would begin to, quote-unquote, prophesy what the people wanted to hear again. They were greedy. They were idolatrous. They loved money. They loved comfort. Prophets for hire. Truth didn't matter. Justice didn't matter. What mattered was that their pockets were lined with cash. Look at verse 6. Therefore, God, there's a, a play on words here. Therefore, to the prophets, God says this. It will be night for you without vision and darkness for you without divination. The sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. I'm going to read you a passage from Amos as well. I love the way Amos writes here related to this. Amos 8, 11, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land. We know what a famine is. There's no food, there's no water. Send a famine on the land. But then he says this, Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. It's going to be silence. It's going to be silence. Principle number four we find in this text is this, Where God is absent, darkness overwhelms. Where God is absent, darkness overwhelms. The picture here is of crushing darkness overwhelming darkness and pain and shame for the false prophets years ago i went uh, on a tour uh, it was i believe in east tennessee if i remember it was ruby falls i don't know if anyone here has been there before but it's a underground cavern it's a it's a cavern underground that has a waterfall underground they don't really know where the source of this waterfall is it's just a beautiful underground waterfall and they put you on a uh, elevator they take you down 300 feet or so below the soil and they let you out you walk in there and there's just a beautiful waterfall there and our tour guide said, now we're going to turn the lights off for a minute. We want you to see how dark it is down here. Flip the lights off, and it was, you've probably experienced, it was a darkness that you could almost feel. It was oppressive. It was heavy. Knowing that if that light didn't come back on, there's no way to get out of there. It was that, but you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. That's the imagery being used here for the false prophets. And the wordplay is this, in the same way that they brought darkness into the land through falsehood, God said it's about to be night for the prophets. In the same way that the false prophets brought blindness to the land, pitch black darkness was descending on them. They would even turn, tragically it says here, they would even turn to demonic divination, which was obviously forbidden by God in Deuteronomy 18 and in many other places. That's how desperate they were. Desperation would rule the day for the false prophets. But it wasn't just darkness. It wasn't just desperation. There was also shame. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, the seers will be ashamed. And the diviners, there's that word again, the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will cover their mouths, literally mustaches. They'll cover their mustaches because there's no answer from God. No answer from God. Silence. False prophets crying out to God, not your will, but our will be done. Very well. Silence. They'll be ashamed at the false prophecies that fall flat. They'll be horrified when after telling everyone God's never going to let anything bad happen to you, peace, prosperity, invaders would conquer them. They'll cover their mouths as a symbol of shame, regret, horror, and shock. But verse 8 gives us a very different picture of the true prophet of God. A great contrast, look at verse 8. On the other hand, Micah says, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage. To make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel, his sin. Notice the difference there. Micah, filled with power. False prophets filled with weakness. They were sellouts. They were pragmatists. Micah, filled with power, filled with the Spirit of God. What is the overflow of that? He says, I'm courageous. A person of justice. 
who does and who says what is honorable in the sight of God. He calls out evil. He does not endorse evil. Endorse evil. He knows what is right. He knows what is wrong. So think about the difference here. You've got truth and boldness, justice, power, the Spirit of God evident versus the false prophets, falsehood, pragmatism, greed, shame, injustice, demonism, and darkness. But here's the crazy part about this. Micah was not nearly as popular in this day as the false prophets. Think about that for a minute. The very false prophets who were fleecing the flock of God. The very ones who were harming them. And yet, those are the ones they chose. Those are the ones they wanted. That just shows us why Israel and and Judah were so messed up at this time. Again, there was dysfunction at every level of society in these days from top down. The people were idolatrous. They were following leaders who were idolatrous. They were, they, were, they were following leaders, both civil and religious, who were liars, who were greedy, who were men of injustice and bribery. Now look at verses 9 through 11. Now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and the rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice, who twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. Her priests instruct for a price. Her prophets divine, there's third time, divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord saying, is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. Principle number five here, and I know this one is, boy, it's so evident in our society today. Principle number five, where God is absent, perversion is normalized. Where God is absent, perversion is normalized. Perversion is seen in so many different ways in these verses. Literally, every level of society was broken. Every level had become perverted. This, by the way, is Satan's goal for all of our lives. Pervert that which is good. Pervert that which is of God. Call injustice, justice, and justice, injustice. Normalize sin. That is what Satan wants to do in our country. That's what he wants to do in our world, in our lives. Normalize sin. Normalize sin to the point where those who believe biblical truth are considered to be an imminent threat. Normalize sin to where people who call evil good and good evil are celebrated. They're put on a pedestal. This is who we need to look like. Which, by the way, all of this is happening today in our society. We need to pray earnestly for our nation. We need to pray earnestly for an awakening in our land. And we need to pray for revival. And listen, we need to understand that as we pray for God to raise up people within our nation to be to be to be those who share truth boldly we also need to understand that we are those people it is us it is the church of the living god it is christians we are the people who are to boldly share the only message that can bring awakening to our land and to our world it is the it is the only message that is the power of god unto salvation to anyone who will believe that's the message we have So as we pray for awakening, we need to say, God, here, like Isaiah, here I am, send me. Make me the vessel through which your message goes into this world. Make me the vessel through which your gospel awakens a land. Look at verse 9 again. Verse 9, now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. Whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is of good reputation, they twist it. They were twisted in their thinking, which always leads to twisted actions. The word, the Hebrew word here for twist is a word that means to form into a bent or distorted shape. The idea is of taking the measuring rod of the perfectly straight character of God from which morals and ethics derive and twisting it, distorting it, trying to make a new standard of what is right, rejecting what actually is right. Again, this is so abundantly evident in our day. Look at verse 10. Who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. They built Jerusalem, it says here, with injustice. They stole from the poor. They allowed the the vulnerable to be taken advantage of. They built Jerusalem on the backs of slaves and the impoverished. Verse 11. Are are you seeing a theme here? Just injustice. That's why in a few weeks we're going to come to Micah 6, 8 that says, What does the Lord require of you? To do good, to love justice, and to walk humbly with your God. That's kind of the theme of this book. It's love God and love your fellow man verse 11 here her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe her priests instruct for a price her prophets divine for money yet they lean on the lord saying is not the lord in our midst calamity will not come upon us this verse tells us in these days positive judgments were for the highest bidder 
spiritual instruction had a price tag. If you paid enough, they'd say what you wanted to hear. There were also, as we've seen multiple times in this text, there were financially motivated, demonically inspired visions. They would conjure up demonic spirits. The prophets, the, the prophets of God, quote unquote, would conjure up demonic spirits if the price were right, were right. Yet, it says at the end of verse 11, they still lied to and insisted to the people that God's never going to allow anything bad to happen, such as captivity. Look at verse 12. Therefore, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. Once again, we see a promise of captivity and ruin for her sin. Now, very quickly, I, I did want to mention this. This verse that I just read, verse 12, would later be quoted by the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah and uh, Michael were not contemporaries. Jeremiah came later. Jeremiah 26, 18, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he spoke to all the peoples of, of Judah, saying, and here's where he quotes it, Thus the Lord of hosts has said, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins, and the, mountains of the, high, uh, the mountain of the house is high places in a forest. Now we know that this prophecy of Micah would happen over a century and a half after he gave this prophecy in the year 586 B.C. Jeremiah, on the other hand, saw it. He experienced it. He was there. That's why he's the weeping prophet. He saw the fall of Jerusalem. So again, the fall of Israel, 722, the fall of Judah, 586 B.C., because of the continued unrepentant rebellion of God's people. Now, here's, here's kind of my main point in all this. Where God is absent, it's been all of my points, where God is absent through rejection, where God is absent, chapter 3 is what we get. It's what it leads us to. Where God is rejected, this is what you get, a wasteland of moral decay, a wasteland of broken lives, and the consequences of open rebellion against God. It is a scary, scary thing for God to turn man over to his fleshly desires. Now, this chapter has been about leaders, but these same principles apply to us as individuals. They apply to our own lives. When we seek to push God out, chapter 3 is what we get. This is where we end. This is the, the natural spiritual end of when a person tries to push God out of their lives, this is where it ends every time. This is where it ends. So what do we do? And what do we do to guard against this? First of all, watch our lives closely. The Apostle Paul, when writing a young pastor named Timothy, he told Timothy, he said, watch not only your doctrine. You know, often we can get into this thing of, you know, I just need to know what I believe and that'll be enough. And that is great theology, study of God. We need to know what we believe, why we believe it. But Paul said, watch your doctrine and your life closely. What we believe, how we live is important. We need to watch that. And the most important step in that obviously is knowing Christ. It's not a pull yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps theology that we have. It is we are wrecked and ruined by sin and Jesus did what we could not do. He lived the life we could not live, and he died a sinner's death, though sinless, for you and for me so that we could be forgiven and have life. That's the gospel. Do you know Christ? Have you ever repented of your sins, trusted in what he has done on your behalf for your salvation? There are not many different ways up the mountain of salvation. A lot of people that believe that, you know, salvation is at the top of the mountain, and, and there's a lot of different paths you can take to get there. It might be Buddha. It might be good works. It might be Jesus. It might be Allah. It might be whatever. But Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is an exclusive gospel that we have. There is no other way to God, only through Christ. Do you know him? Second thing we need to learn from this and remember is this. We've got to love God first and foremost. As Paul wrote to the Colossian church, Christ must be preeminent in our lives, first place in all things. Third, we have to make a conscious, cho a conscious choice to choose his will, not ours. We need to look to God in humility and say, God, not my will but your will be done in my life. Wherever, wherever that takes me, whatever that means, whatever it costs, you are infinitely worthy of my worship. Whatever you desire, I want to do. Number four, make sure that our minds are being renewed through truth. What we allow in our minds is so critical in the way we live our lives. What we allow in here affects how we live out there. So watch what we allow into our hearts and minds. And then number five, share the only message that can change things. It is not, I want to be careful saying this because we need to vote, we need to be active in this, but it is not political reform or legislation that will make people new. It is the gospel. It is Christ. It's the message of Christ. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, some trust in politicians and reform. 
but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We must be about our Father's business. I'm going to ask you right now to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, right now, I thank you so much for your word today in chapter 3. God, I know that it, like chapter 2, is a very heavy chapter as, as indictments are brought against chapter 2, the people and the, the false prophets, chapter 3, the religious and the civil leaders. But God, I pray that we would heed the warnings that we find in these chapters. That we would love you preeminently, that you would be our Lord, and we would be your servants. Father, if there's anyone here today or watching online that doesn't know you, God, we pray that you would save them. You would convict their hearts, wreck them, and burden them right now with their need for you and save them. Lord, if there's anyone watching right now who's leaning on good works, leaning on ritualism, God, I pray that you would show them right now clearly that those things cannot ever save. It's only the blood of Christ. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room or watching right now. God, I do pray that we would surrender our lives to you, that you would have first place in every area of our lives. God, those areas we struggle with, those areas that we have a tendency to exalt to the place where you belong, God, I pray that you would, first of all, help us identify those areas, give us discernment, and help us to come free of those areas. Lord, be on the throne of our hearts. Be preeminent in our lives. God, I pray for the relationships we have in our lives, our, our sphere of influence, our friends, our family, our co-workers. God, help us to be mindful of the needs around us. Help us to see other people. Help us to not get so busy with uh, things that have to be done every day that we miss people. God, help us to look for people around us who are hurting who are discouraged right now. And God, give us the words to say. Help us to live out our faith in word and deed. God, thank you again for your grace and your love in our lives. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and would like to talk about any of this, please let me know. I'd love to, to hang around and chat with you after this uh, or set up a time to meet with you. Um, we're going to stand here in a moment. And as we, as we sing this old hymn, I ask you to do so in a spirit of worship. Let's stand together and sing. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world
again. So I cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. And I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday. Hey, I may, uh, I may go ahead and start the missions meeting right now because it's lunchtime and I'm hungry. So um, go ahead and get it started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can go on a mission trip. if you, Well, actually, next year would be hard, wouldn't it? But yeah. Keep going. Yep, I understand. Yep, yep, totally. All right. Um, will someone help me? Yeah, Joseph, you look like you're a willing participant to do this. Uh, we are we are live streaming this. I'll tell those if any of you are watching right now. I know a few of you are. Ashton's waving at you right now. Um, if you would like uh, one of these documents with this basic information, send me an email and I'll respond by sending this document back to you on the you know if you're watching on live stream. Uh, the the purpose of this meeting today is not to give very very detailed itinerary of what we're going to be doing. So if you're a Type A person, this meeting will drive you absolutely nutty. Uh, so <laughs> some some of these things. Some of these trips, we just don't know exactly what we're going to do. We have a basic idea of what we're going to be doing, but don't know 100% what we'll be doing. So all I want to do is read through this sheet and ask if you have any questions. Uh, so I'll just start at the top. And there's, as you guys know, there's a lot of variables, uh, especially on these ones early in the year, because we don't know if there's going to be COVID restrictions. Thank you. We, don't, we just don't really know what to expect uh, as far as travel goes early in the year. But our, our first trip we're looking to take is to Uganda. And this is going to be late March or early April. Uh, you know, a lot of times people hear a trip to Africa and it's kind of intimidating, but this is truly a, a really, really, once you get there and get back, the travel is the worst part. It's a, a lot of flying, but once you're there, it is a laid back, wonderful trip. It really is. Uh, so late March to early April, estimated cost $2,000. And I, I want to make this very clear. I am giving you very, I'm giving you high end estimates. I think it'll be quite a bit less than this, but I'd rather give you a high estimate and come down than start low and have to go up. So uh, around $2,000 and uh, location is Kisoro, which is s extreme Southwest Uganda. It's right on the border of Congo and Rwanda. In fact, what we'll do is we'll fly into Rwanda. Uh, in the past, we've flown into Entebbe, Uganda, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's where the, the main airport, the international airport is, and then we would drive cross-country, but it's like a 12-hour drive, whereas we fly into Kigali, which we did two years ago, and you have a four-hour drive. So I'll uh, fly into Rwanda. So you can knock out two nations uh, off, your, off your list if you go there. You can go to Rwanda and Uganda. Uh, and so basically what Pastor George has asked is he has asked that the men teach in the Bible college, the ladies go out in the village, and they do women's conferences uh, out in the villages. Uh, so... That is the most basic description I can give you of that, uh, but that is a fun trip. I, I will tell you this, what we do is typically from about 9 to 4, we're doing our teaching, whether it be out in the village or in the city, uh, and then in the afternoon, we were just back at the hotel just hanging out as a team. So there's a lot of downtime involved as well, and it's great, great team building. It's just a fun trip. It's one of my favorite trips that, we, that, we've, that, we, that I've ever been on is, is to this. It's in the mountains. It's one of the last places in the world where um, silverback mountain gorillas still wa roam free. Not in the city. They're not going to attack you or anything. You have to go way up in the hills. Uh, but it's, it's the temperature is perfect there. It's 60s, 70s. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful place. Wonderful people. Very safe there. Second trip is Costa Rica. And I totally forgot to put dates on there. I have the dates for that. Just put down July there. It's going to be around mid, uh, early July for that one. Um, I'm sorry, apologize for that. I wrote the missionaries, and, and they said the dates that I, in fact, let me just, let me give you those dates really quick. It'll take me a minute to look these up. Yes. There you go. There you go. So the dates for this trip are going to be, need one more? There you go. I got, you need one, Terry? Because I've got one left. Oh, it's for, okay. July 6th through the 15th is what I proposed to the missionaries, and they said that that should work for them. So that's 
probably out of all these, that's probably one of the more solidified dates is July 6th through the 15th. Um, location, Puriscal, I think that's how you pronounce it, Costa Rica. Uh, we'll work with Global Outreach Missionaries Franklin and Evelyn Turner. I've never met them. This is who we were going to work with this year, and then COVID stuff happened. Uh, again, details here are not fully worked out, but it'll likely consist, if it's similar to last, what they had for us last year, light construction, Bible studies in the village, and some basic human needs ministry is what we'll be doing there. I know that's kind of a vague description, but um, I'll have more, more details as we get closer. Estimated cost, 1300 Again, I, I really do think it's going to be less than that, but it, it, I just want to start a little higher. But it'll be in that, in that range, which is a very, very cheap uh, mission trip for something like that for that many days. Uh, the third one here, this is um, really, really far away, Bismarck, North Dakota. June 10th through the 13th, estimated cost 250 for that. That'll just be hotels mainly. Uh, and, and Chris Wallace has preached here a couple of times. This is working with Chris and Christy and Hope City Church. They're a brand new church there that, that our church supports financially. and We've helped them in other ways. And uh, they requested that we come out, do some door-to-door. -door. Basically what we do in our town, some door-to-door -door canvassing, block parties, uh, just as a, as a front door event where people can come in and learn more about the church and, and have some contacts and some friendships built there. So that'll be a quick one, and that'll be a great trip. It'll mean the world to them. Um, I probably sh I'm not going to say this because it's live streaming, but yes, that's, that's a good trip for you to go to. I'd love for you to go there. Uh, and then the final trip is Mexico, November, December. About a year from now is when that will be late next year. Uh, do, do any of you guys remember? I don't know if any of you were even at the church at this time. Were any of you here when the building was the other way, the sanctuary was back here? Okay, a few of you were. Do, do you happen to remember a couple that came here? They're named Jerry and Sue Machetta. You remember them? They only came for about six months, and then they, they moved to Texas. Uh, anyhow, they've got a really neat ministry. They came through town about two months ago, and I had coffee with them. And they've got a really, really neat ministry that they're doing. Uh, they're, I mean, they're not in, in, he wasn't a pastor. They're a retired couple now. He wasn't, a, you know, they weren't in ministry or anything like that, but they just have a, a love for God and a heart for, for people, and they live near the Mexican border. And so they work, they go in several times a month into, into Nuevo Progreso, Mexico. Uh, I map quested it, and if we fly into McAllen, Texas, it's only like a 45-minute drive there once, you know, once you get across through, custom, through the border control and everything. Uh, but we'll be working with, with Jerry and Sue doing a combination of medical and food distribution in impoverished areas of northern Mexico. So that might be a great option. Again, 900 is the estimated cost. I, I do think it'll be cheaper than that. But uh, So any questions on any of this? I know this is very, this is totally not detailed description, but uh, it'll be the um, around eight or nine days typically is what we what we do there eight or nine days and and really it would probably be a little less than that because i know that's kind of a stretch for some but it you know it's two days travel there two days back so you have about five or six days in country typically when we do that you know five or six days of ministry not in country but of ministry there so we would fly to kigali stay the night in a hotel there then the next day drive into kisoro do five days of ministry or so then drive back to kisoro stay the night there and then fly out so any other questions on this? I'm hu are you hungry? I'm ready for lunch. I don't want to. I don't like long meetings, and so I'm totally fine if you don't have questions. But if you do, uh, you know, contact me, let me know, and I'll answer any questions you have. There'll be more details coming out about these soon. Uh, I just wanted to get these to us as early as possible, um, so that we could. I just I would like for you to be praying about this and have a basic idea of cost. One thing I will tell you: I know some of these these numbers can be a little bit kind of scary to you, but uh, I don't think we've ever had anyone here at our church that couldn't go because of money. If, if you know, if God calls you to go, he's going to provide for that. And, uh, and there are a lot of people in this church and in your, fa you know, families and friends who would love to help you get on a mission trip like this. We, bef as we do a team training for each of these, we'll give you like a, a sample card that you can, you know, put your information in and, and mail that out to different people and ask people for prayer or for, you know, uh, financial help or whatever. And people are very, very willing to help. There's a lot of people who can't go but they, they're very willing to help others go. So don't let money be a, a factor in this. I mean, you need to work hard to try and raise it and all that, but just don't, don't say, well, I can't do this. All these are too much. So any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, we, we would probably need to have our, our tickets booked by mid-January so I would need to know 
pretty quickly. If, it, if you're interested in that trip, just come talk to me, and I can, I can give you a little more details there. But uh, it prep in terms of, like, the, what we'll be doing, the work there. So, yeah, it's not intimidating because the Bible, the, the Bible school that they have there in Kisoro is not accredited by the, by the country, by the state, and they don't want it to be because Pastor George said if it's accredited, then the majority of his people, he's in a village, the majority of his people don't have the, the basic requirements to get into a Bible school like that. So it is more about learning. It's more about, it's, it's not about academics. It's about, so there's certain courses he'll ask us to teach, like spiritual formations, like how to have a quiet time, how to, you know, things like that. And then there's some that are more in-depth, but especially for that trip, if whatever we're teaching, we will definitely have six or eight meetings beforehand and help everyone prep for that. So that's a good point. It's, that one can seem intimidating. You think, I'm going to, to train leaders in Africa. I'm not, but it's really not. You can do it, and, uh, and we'll definitely help you along the way in that. Dave Vineyard is, I'm, it's like I'm getting real-time texts. I am getting real-time texts. But Dave said, what is the name of the city in Costa Rica again? Dave, it is Puriscal, P-U-R-I-S-C-A-L. And then I have no idea what and Alex means. So you might have to text me again and tell me what that means. And then Doug Manansky said, can't hear questions. I'm not going to repeat them all, Doug, so I'm sorry. You'll just have to ask me later about that. And then some, and the guy, Luke, in, in uh, Hedinger is asking me if we need any vaccinations for any of the foreign missions. Uh, for Uganda, uh, you will need yellow fever vaccination, uh, which you can get um, in rapid, typically. You have to call a little ahead to make sure they have it or they can get it in. Or you, I think some of, Ashton, didn't, didn't uh, is Emily or, is Emily in here? Didn't Emily and Carrie go to Gillette to get theirs also? Renee, yeah. Okay, Dr. Stotts, Stotts with travel medicine, Stocks with travel medicine, in rapid? Okay, perfect, thank you, thank you. So for Uganda, it's just yellow fever, uh, and sometimes they want you to have that, you're supposed to have a yellow fever, a little booklet proving that you have that vaccination. Sometimes they ask for that, and other times they don't, but it's just best to have it, so you're not having to get it done at the border. Ashton just sent me a text that said, this is the future. Um, so any other questions in here? Uh, for, I'm sorry, but back to that question of vaccinations. Costa Rica, we don't need any, they said. Uh, and Mexico, I would assume we're not going to need any for that as well, but I can certainly find out about that. I don't know. Some of you guys know North Dakotans better than me. Do we need vaccinations for that trip? Might. <laughs> Renee said, I would make sure your tetanus is up to date as well. Yeah, that's especially for the light construction stuff, that'd be a great one, yep. Dave Vineyard said, please feel free to tell everyone to contact him about Uganda if they want to know more about teaching, because Dave's been there a couple times and helped with that and can give you some info on that. All right, any other questions? Noah, you got any? Okay. All right, I think that's all I have then, and, it, and as, as usual, if you have any questions you think of later, just send me an email or call me or whatever, and I'll do my best to answer them. Again, more information will be available here soon when we know a little bit more details about each of these trips. So, I'd love for you guys to go. I really would. You would not regret it. God would use it in your life, regardless of which one of these you end up going on. So, I'm, can I pray for us before we leave, and then we'll, then we'll head out. Father, thank you for this time. God, I do pray for everyone who is interested in this. Um, those who are here, those who are watching, God, I just pray that you would give us a, a very, very strong desire to be people who go out in your name, Lord, and, and share your message. Uh, and Lord, I pray that, that, that we would also be mindful of the needs right here in our town, in, in Belfouche, Hedinger, wherever we are as we're watching this, God, that we would be mindful of, of the needs in our areas and that we would be missionaries right where we are. And uh, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in here who is a little bit afraid of this, that you would just help them. God, we know that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but God, we know if you've called us to this, you will bring us through it, you will help us, you will provide, and you will grow us through it. And so I pray for any who might be on the edge, that they would step out on faith, and that they would be a part of one of these teams, and uh, for, for your glory. And uh, God, thank you for everyone who is here today. 
and just pray you keep us safe as we travel back home in Jesus name.